Manish Basim presents the Football League Show. Hello there, with the internationals over, we're back to full strength on the Football League show with some intriguing top-of-the-table clashes in all three divisions. While well, talking of the top, Swansea last night moved into third place with a win over Derby, which probably explains why our guest this evening, Robbie Savage, isn't exactly in the greatest of moods. He's alongside Steve Carriage and Lizzie's waiting to hear from you. Lizzie. Yeah, this is where you get to set the agenda. Tell us your footballing stories of the day. And don't forget, I can also put your questions to Robbie and Steve and make them as tough as you like. You can text us on 81111 or send us an email to footballleague at bbc.co.uk. Thanks, Lizzie. So it's top and bottom that we concentrate on tonight. Cardiff could move to within a point of the Championship's top two with a win over a steadily improving Barnsley. Ipswich are also proving harder to beat, but they were still one place off the bottom going to today's meeting with Sheffield Wednesday. The team below Ipswich were Peterborough. They kicked off at Bramall Lane with a new manager, with most of us still wondering why the last one left. Two months ago, Barnsley had lost five in a row and were bottom of the championship. But things have steadied under Mark Robbins with two defeats from seven. Well, today they took on a Cardiff team who boasted the, div the division's top two scorers. Alistair Mann is your commentator. The team who've conceded the most goals at home in the division entertain the one who scored the most on their travels. And both sides have mixed news regarding team selection. Barnsley skipper Stephen Foster returns after suspension. His usual centre-half partner Darren Moore, though, is missing because of a foot injury. Argentine midfielder Hugo Colache was a doubt but has been past fit, so the rest of the side is unchanged. For Cardiff, top league scorer Michael Chopra has served his one-match ban and returns, but Jay Bothroyd has to come to a knee problem. 12-goal Peter Whittingham has recovered from injury, but centre-half Anthony Gerrard has a calf strain. Hungarian Gabor Giepesh makes his first league start of the campaign in Gerrard's absence. The wind does seem to be worsening, and as, as it does do, so does the rain. It really has been a sudden old month, November. Burke. Helped on by McCormack and Chopper on the far side wasn't a million miles away from the ball in. I suspect McCormack was going for goal rather than the layoff. It was instinctive and it was close, but I think Chopper was closer to getting it and the ball was ending in the back of the net. Two Barnsley players for company, and the referee has indicated that he was having his shirt pulled by Anderson. That's the offence. And the kick was taken quickly, and uh, wasn't too far off target either. Quick thinking from Cardiff. They weren't a million miles off target either here. McCormack just belted it goalbound. Luke Steele hurled himself towards it and was mightily relieved to see it flash by his upright. Here's Bogdanovich into the path of Mack and Cleverly. No one really in the middle to aim for, so goes back towards Dickinson. Now there's a target. And it was Bogdanovich who got a reasonable contact on it, but it was never going to trouble David Marshall in the Cardiff City goal. towards Bogdanovic, touched on into the path of Anderson. Still Anderson. Kolache to hit it, took a deflection, goes out for a corner, could have gone anywhere. Hit Giepesh. And it really could have ended up in the back of the net, as it was. It goes out for the corner, it was well struck by Kolache. 
Hamill takes it just over the head of Shotton. Anderson. One of the most famous sons of this part of Yorkshire. Famous cricketing umpire, Dickie Bird, a regular at Oakwell. McCormack trying to get the better of Shotton and unable to do so. And again, a masterclass in defending from the, the man on loan from Stoke. Barnsley, meanwhile, have a free kick. Hamill was upended. Referee wants a word with Ledley. It was his challenge that sent Hamill to the floor. Barnsley free kick. Over Shotton and almost over Marshall as well. Marshall looked in some danger, just bounced from his grasp. Foster was close by, Kennedy with the acrobatics. Hume jumping, not able to get there, ball breaks for Hamill. Hamill goes straight at Quinn. Good delivery, palmed away as far as Kalache, who is off balance, and he skied his volley. It's as good a chance as there's been in this second half, in truth. Hamill's cross was pretty good, and Marshall felt there was no way he could catch it, and it sat up to be volleyed. Dickinson. Going long towards you. Won by Gierpesh. In by Kalache. Anderson. Claims of handball. It's given. Last chance. Free kick. Right on the edge. Well, he was booked for it, Hudson. Handball, the verdict. Could we have a winning goal? Right at the end. Dickinson hits it, took a deflection, and he's won the game! Well, Mark Robbins is trying to conceal his emotions, but what a bonus for Barnsley. They've two more points than they thought they were going to get. Time is up, and Dickinson whacks it, takes a deflection, and goes into the corner. And it's won right at the end. Absolute joy for Barnsley, despair for Cardiff. Sometimes you've just got to take it on the chin, it's a cruel deflection. Um, probably our own little bit of a downfall as well because we chased a, a nothing ball down and when they've kicked it forward we're out of shape a little bit, but um, there are things that we need to learn and, and learn pretty quick. I, I was saying to the lads yesterday, funny enough, in training that uh, I'll get my first goal and uh, lucky enough it's come through and you know I, I went I went mad uh, so uh, <laughs> but now nah, I mean it's an unbelievable feeling to get my first goal and hopefully you know I can get a few more and as soon as possible they've been excellent I just said to them there they can be proud of uh, uh, one another and um, you know they've taken it on to the next stage and we just said we can't rest on our laurels you know we've got to keep uh, keep going they keep setting the standards and uh, you know, they're confident, and we're playing against uh, opposition that are, that are well fancied this year, whereas we were written off. Um, you know, now I think that uh, the pundits may be thinking again. Well, let, let's ask our two pundits here tonight. Robbie, what about you? Barnsley's revival under Mark Robbins, has that forced a rethink as to what they can achieve this season? Yeah, I think it started against us at Pride Park. Um, we played against Mark's team in the second game in charge. Um, they come to Pride Park and they beat us 3-2. Um, an entertaining game, they got the ball down and passed it well. And fair play to him, he's turned around and, you know, I was at Leicester with Mark and he's a, he's a nice bloke and, you know, he's doing exceptionally well with them. Same goes for you, I suppose, Steve, doesn't it? Mm, yeah, I mean, they'd lost five on the spin when he took over and what they have become is that, first and foremost, he's built a foundation where they become difficult to beat and difficult to play against. And what happens then is you stay in games for long periods, yeah. like they have today, all right, they've had a little bit of luck, an element of luck, and that's, that's seen them through. But they, on the whole, you know, as I say, he's given them a foundation, and, and from that, I mean, they, they've played very, very well. Robbie, what do you make about the unpredictability of the championship? How do you make head or tails of it? I mean, that's one of the worst defences against the best attack in the division. Yeah, this league is so strange. You know, anybody on their day can beat anybody. Um, we went to Cardiff, got beat 6-1. Yeah. Went to Leicester, who I felt you know, on the day, you know, when their top three spot is... is 
you know, for me, they, they shouldn't be there, but they're a very good team. But on, the, on that day, you know, we should have beat them and we, we're near the bottom of the league. So on, on anybody can beat anybody. Uh, and a word for Cardiff's Stephen McPhail. It's emerged today that he's battling cancer, uh, a lymphoma it is. We certainly wish him all the best, don't we? Yeah, we do. Um, another good friend of mine, Andy Legg, also suffered from a disease um, of cancer in the neck and he got over it. So that bides well for Stephen McPhail and we, we wish him all the best. You echo those sentiments? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I think they've got it early. So, um, yeah, we keep our fingers crossed. Sure. Now, one of the reasons Robbie's with us is because, as I mentioned earlier, his Derby side played last night against the Swansea team, who are top of the form table and flying under Paula Sosa. So a tough ask then for Robbie and his teammates to get their first away win. There was a huge incentive for Swansea, unbeaten in 10, going into this match, for a win would lift them above fierce rivals Cardiff, overnight at the very least. Derby, who are desperate for points to move away from the drop zone, gifted their hosts a first-half chance. Gary Teal with the back pass. Nathan Dyer couldn't make the most of it, with Stephen Bywater beaten. Derby had Bywater to thank for keeping them in the match either side of the break. The Rams' number one denied Craig Beatty twice, first from a set piece and then from a great flowing move that would have graced any of the teams Swans boss Paolo Sosa turned out for in his illustrious playing career. These teams drew twice last season, and with nine minutes to play, this one was heading the same way. Until Joe Allen played in Federico Bissone. The Argentine outpacing Robbie Savage to secure another late win for Swansea, lifting them to their highest league position in 26 years. Yeah, Robbie certainly didn't appreciate that name check in that commentary, did you? No win in the last 12 away games, Robbie. I mean, it's going from strength to strength for Swansea. Is this becoming an issue now with the players, with your poor away form? No, it's not. We, you know, we believe when we step on the pitch, when we play well, we're as good as anybody, as this league says. Um, going to Swansea, we honestly thought we could get something. We yeah. defended really well for long periods. It was always going to be difficult going to a Swansea team that can pass the ball well. But they never really hurt us, other than another two chances we've seen. Now, it's fair to say, right, you've made your name as a pretty fiery midfielder, full of energy. But it's also fair to say, um, centre-half isn't your best position, is it? No, it, the goal transpired... Come on, you're, you're the, stopping yourself from laughing, Steve. No, the, the goal transpired from, you know, the, um, the left-back there is, should have cleared the ball at the line. Yeah. It goes across, you know, I've moved across. It can be stopped, can't it, Rob? Um, I mean, look at the players you've got. You've got one, two, three, four in that yeah. picture and he goes through the middle of them yeah. and Robbie, to be fair, and Robbie's going to say, no. you know, maybe he could have done better, but Robbie's the only one out of those four players to react and that's why Robbie's made a career out of the game and he's stayed yes. in the game so long, because he sees danger quicker than others, but unfortunately he just didn't, couldn't quite get there. Yeah, I've seen it, but I've seen it too late. And it looks like there, I'm treading water. I'm, yeah. You, you know. were. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was either that or lead in your boots, I wasn't quite sure. But, you know, the goal, it's, it's a catalog of errors. But up until that point, we defended really, really well. And yeah. probably the, the best we've defended all season. The, yeah. the centre-halves are fantastic. The goalkeeper made some good saves. And Swansea didn't hurt us. So, overall, it was a decent away performance without getting the result. OK. Well, it was Swansea who were the last team to beat West Brom, and that was six games ago. Since then, the Baggies have been scoring goals for fun lately. But they were up against Bristol City, who themselves were unbeaten in seven league games. Expectations are high at the Hawthorns after recent impressive wins over Watford and Leicester. Visitors Bristol City were unlucky not to take the lead as early as the third minute. Scott Carson came out to clear and didn't do so. Cole Skews' shot looked to be heading in, only for Gianni Zyvalon to clear. Bristol City haven't had much luck away from home, and from the resulting breakaway, Jerome Thomas went on a fine run and matched it with a cracking finish. It was the Baggies' eighth goal in three games, and there were more to come. For nine minutes later, they scored again. Look out for a lovely touch from Chris Brunt as he controls Graham Doran's long ball forward. Brunt claiming his fifth goal of the season. And the match was ended as a contest shortly after half-time. Simon Cox's chip looked to be going wide until Lewis Carey's intervention. West Brom 3-0 up and heading for a third successive win. Gary Johnson will have plenty of questions to ask after a dreadful defensive performance. Simon Cox allowed time and space to finish from Thomas's cross. There was still time for a goal to remember on an afternoon to forget for City supporters. Paul Hartley with that spectacular 30-yard free kick. It proved to be the only negative on a very positive afternoon for West Bromwich Albion.
A run of four wins in six had lifted Queen's Park Rangers into the playoff positions. They faced a Doncaster team who had only won once in their last 11, but it was Donny who forced that chance after the break, Billy Sharp with the shot. Sharp, on loan from Sheffield United, was Rovers' joint top scorer going into this match. He volleyed in his fifth in the league to put his team ahead at a wet and windy Keepmoat Stadium and sparked an unusual celebration. Now, what on earth is all this about? The goal gave Rovers an obvious lift, as Rangers again gave the ball away in defence. Northern Ireland international Dean Shields expertly taking advantage and securing a 2-0 victory for Doncaster. A win that's a huge boost to Sean O'Driscoll's team as they battle to keep their championship status once again. It might seem half a lifetime ago since Reading last won at home in the championship. It possibly was for this young fan. Incredibly, Reading hadn't won in the league at the Medeski since January. Brendan Rodgers demanded a higher intensity from his team against Blackpool and the Royals looked fired up from the start. Simon Church going close from Brian Howard's corner. And Jimmy Kebe had a shot saved by Matthew Jilks as Reading heeded their manager's advice. But Blackpool are no pushovers this season. Ian Holloway's team had a great chance to take the lead themselves before the break. Ben Burgess's shot could hardly have been closer. It took until the second half for a goal to arrive, and it was Reading who scored it. Gilfy Sigurdsson giving the long-suffering fans some hope, as he scored only Reading's fourth home league goal of the season, a major reason for their low league position. Blackpool had to do without Hammer Buatza, who had an audience with the Algerian president to celebrate his country's World Cup qualification. But they've plenty of other attacking options, two of them combined as Charlie Adams set up Brett Ormerod for the equaliser. Brendan Rodgers brought Gregor Zraziak on as a second-half substitute as the Royals pushed to end that miserable Medeski run. The move paid off as the Polish striker headed in eight minutes from the end. After 17 matches without a home win, this one felt good. Reading out of the bottom three. Plymouth stepped out at the Walkers Stadium looking for a third win in a row on the second anniversary of Paul Sturrock's return to the club. The Pilgrims won at Leicester the last time they played here, but it was the high-flying Foxes who were creating all the chances in the first half. Plymouth fortunate on that occasion. Leicester continued to press in the second half and thought they should have had a penalty after some excellent work by leading scorer Matty Fryatt. His shot appeared to strike the arm of Carrie Arneson, the referee decided it was not a spot kick. Three minutes into added time, Leicester finally made the breakthrough to deny Plymouth a point. Danny and Gesson's effort was blocked. It fell kindly to Andy King. Paul Sturrock described the late goal as a kick in the teeth. But for Nigel Pearson, another precious three points. It was another very hard championship game and um, I suppose what it does it illustrates how how tough the season can be. Yeah Leicester quietly climbing the table <laughs> as for West Brom a good win for them today over uh, Bristol City side yeah. obviously you know been, seven. yeah been very good under Gary mm. Johnson. Very much so. Telling stat, though, in all ten games that they've won, they've taken the lead and hung on to them. I mean, uh, that tells yeah. a lot about the side. Yeah, I mean, they don't just hang on to it. They take, take something from it, don't they? And, I mean, what they don't do is that, you know, when, when, sometimes, subconsciously, when you take a lead in a game, if, you know, if things haven't probably been going your way, you'll take a step back and, and want to protect what you've got. Mm. Well, West, Ham don't, uh, West Brom don't do that. If they score a goal, their, their, their first intention is to take a step forward. You know, and they just carry on in a similar vein. And that's the way that they play, and they play with the freedom. And when they're playing well... And they're very difficult to play against. Terrific, terrific result for Doncaster. I mean, uh, beating Queen's Park Rangers, what was it, 2-0? QPR, the best side, you said, you faced this season. Yeah, we played them last month. Um, we went 2-0 up. Um, but even at 2-0 down, they still passed the ball. And to be fair, they went out 4-2 winners. And for me, they were the best team we've played all season. In Taraft and Routledge, two of the best players in the division. Yeah, good to see Reading finally get that league win at home as well. Now, Ipswich may not be losing games lately, but four draws from their last five means they continue to languish at the bottom. Today, Town welcomed a Sheffield Wednesday side hopelessly out of form with just one point from a possible 12. Commentary comes from Tony Gubber. 
Ipswich are off the bottom of the championship and beaten in their last five games but it's still a season of struggle for manager Roy Keane as they look for only their second win in 17 games tonight against the Sheffield Wednesday side have only taken one point themselves from their last four matches Ipswich have two changes from the team that drew at Reading before the international break. Owen Garvan, a Republic of Ireland under-21 international, comes into central midfield. And Lee Martin, a young winger bought from Manchester United, is preferred to Jonathan Stead. For Sheffield Wednesday, Tommy Miller is unavailable to face his former club because of a hamstring strain, so Michael Gray returns after a similar injury. Wednesday have only won away once this season in eight attempts. Ipswich have possession on that left side. Well, that's a wild challenge. It's going to be a free kick. It may be a yellow card. It was never intended to win the ball. He just went right through Carlos Edwards. Ledbetter will take the free kick. Friskin is the furthest man. It's into the six-yard box on the ground. Grant down to smother it. Spur with the throw. Whipped in by O'Connor. Here's Tudgar. Oh, was there a shout for a handball then? There was by the Sheffield Wednesday players. Andy Durso has ignored those appeals. But it was chipped in by Tudgar. Varney did the flick on, and it certainly struck the hand of Damien Delaney who then pulled it away very quickly and put it <laughs> tried to hide it behind his back. Andy Durso hadn't spotted it. Here's Lee Martin. Oh, good strike and a good save by Lee Grant. It was a fortunate bounce, but he struck it very well. Right-footed. That's uh, bounced awkwardly. Here's Le to guy. Good save. And then Michael Gray with the follow-up has put it wide, but it's the best chance for Sheffield Wednesday. It was a long ball down the middle. Tudgai didn't get the header. When it came back off the defender, he struck it instinctively to goal. And Asmir Bergovic, the Bosnian, showing why he's preferred as the number one choice at the moment. Walters reacts quickly. Here's Rossini. Chipped in. The header didn't get very clear. And it was Carlos Edwards who got right underneath it. And that's gone high over the crossbar. Well, it was a difficult uh, chance. Dropping on the volley. That's not forward. It came off the back of the defender's head. Ipswich try to tee it up for somebody in the end they have and the shot is watched as it just flashes uh, disappointingly wide well, at least they had a shot at the end of a decent spell of possession at the start of the half but Lee Grant wasn't tested not a very pleasant night at Portman Road and still scoreless, and you can see how much the, the wind is snatching at that flag. There's Carlos Edwards, and just look at those poor fans behind him. Sheltering from the wind. Good chance, good strike by Garvan, beaten away by Lee Grant. And once again, the Sheffield Wednesday goalkeeper has come to the rescue. All six feet four inches of him. Ever present in championship games for Wednesday this season. Has kept three clean sheets so far. Oh, that's a good chance. There's a chance here. It's Alan Quinn. Oh, and again, he saved it. They can't get the ball past Lee Grant in goal for Sheffield Wednesday. Very clever flick to set up the chance. Oh, it almost caught the keeper out and he's lost it. And they couldn't force it over the line. 
Well, I wonder if the goalkeeper, Lee Grant, here was caught out by the wind. The ball swerving in the air, and he did really well to stretch out a hand and claw it out of the goal. Looks as if it was going to go straight in. Well, how many chances are his team going to make? Is it going to be draw number 10 this season for Roy Keane's Ipswich? Here's Stead. Oh, and he's brought another good save out of Grant. Edwards gets it back and they have scored. Wednesday are appealing for offside. And the flag is up on the far side. Oh, the fan right behind the linesman on that far side certainly didn't see it that way. But Jonathan Stead just on as a substitute, immediately making an impact. And you've got to say that it does look as if Priskin is offside. Are the players giving absolutely everything they can, or is there more to come from them? Well, I think in terms of effort and, and desire and determination, yeah. And I've been saying that every week for the last few months. And, uh, you know, I'm quite happy on that side of it. But, of course, you know, you need a bit more as well if you want to achieve something in football, whether it be the quality or putting the ball in the back of the net. And we're not quite reaching them levels, you know, that, that, that we'd expect. Um, but we keep going and we keep trying and, uh, and hopefully we'll get it right next weekend. Next weekend they take on Cardiff. So who will be the happier manager of the two after that, Steve? I'm not sure either of them will. I mean, the, the, the problem we're going to get from these two, and I don't see either of them really getting relegated, is that their season is going to be over very, very quickly because they, they, you know, they're going to find it hard to get a playoff spot. And after that, I mean, you're just basically playing the season out. And there's always, already a little bit of a melee about both these clubs. So unless mm. they put a, you know, one of them puts a run together very quickly, you know, by Christmas, you're talking about it's just going to be a case of survival. And that's probably not good enough for either of them. Uh, interestingly, Roy Keane's only fielded one unchanged side in the league this season. Yeah. How much of a telling factor is that? Well, he's, he's obviously, I mean, every time he gives an interview, he's just searching for that extra little bit, isn't he? As he says, I mean, a lot of their play is good. They're creating chances. I think they had 10 shots on, char on target today. Mm. But there's just that, that, that little, there's something missing. And that's obviously what he's searching for. Same goes for Brian Laws and Sheffield Wednesday. I mean, they had eight attempts on target. And yeah. he's looking for more ruthlessness, isn't he? He is. I mean, they finished 12th last year. And I know their intentions were to, to probably better that. I mean, they're, they're not expecting a springboard into the top six, I don't think. But they're expecting a natural progression. And so far this season, He'll probably be disappointed that it hasn't happened. Right. OK. Now it's the start of a new era for Peterborough as Mark Cooper took charge for the first time after the dramatic departure of Darren Ferguson. And Cooper opened his posh account with a trip to Sheffield United, who are bottom of the form table. Mark Clement went to meet him. Two promotions in two and a half years for Darren Ferguson, and yet four points adrift of safety, and with just two wins this season, and one of England's brightest young managerial prospects was gone. Barry, are you as shocked as the rest of us about what's happened at the club over the last couple of weeks? Absolutely. A fortnight ago, the chairman gave Darren 700 grand to get a centre half and a left back in. Don't sound like a chairman that wanted the manager to go to me, does it you? No. So why's he gone? Well, why's he gone? Um, obviously he never spoke to the chairman uh, after the Newcastle game and he ain't spoke to him since. And, um, you know, various things happened during the course of those few days and uh, <clears throat> we found ourselves looking for a new manager, mate. There's something been going on in the background and I don't really know what it is. Two successive promotions, what else can the manager do? I just think we've we panicked. I think there's something gone on behind the scenes, which I don't think we'll ever find out what's happened. So, but like I say, we've got to move on and hopefully get uh, three points to here. I feel absolutely gutted. Um, certainly, I nor the chairman wanted this to happen, but there was obviously a breakdown in communication somewhere, and it was decided that we'd part ways. So, good luck to Darren. I'm sure he won't be out of a job long. Uh, he worked miracles at Peterborough. We're very grateful for that. Um, but that door closes, another one opens. Peterborough United exists. We're only concentrating on what happens with Peterborough United. As for the new fella, like a lot of his Peterborough players, he's got a fine pedigree in non-league football. He's already won promotion once with Kettering and he leaves them in the Blue Square Premier playoff places.
Well, I've heard you've invested in a new suit for the occasion. It's all right, it's all right. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's quite a sort of. Uh, my, mom, my mom treated me to it. Did she? Yeah, bless her. It looks, it looks half decent actually. I have Thank to say. you. Thank How are you feeling? Are you, are you gurgling a little bit? Yeah, a little bit nervous. Yeah, but it's, it's all gone well this week and uh, tried to prepare properly. So hopefully. Uh, We'll see the fruits of that today. You must be proud as hell. You've worked like Billy for mm. this opportunity. Yep, I think there's a lot of boys down there in the conference and the non-league who have to who have to go down there and do their apprenticeship because they've not had top playing careers and uh, they sometimes got overlooked. And hopefully, I can do them a bit of justice and prove that they can be done. Listen, we wish you well today. Thanks, Scott. Great to see you. Cheers, mate. Peterborough have failed to beat Sheffield United in any of their last six League and Cup meetings, but almost got off to the perfect start. New captain George Boyd a fraction away from giving the posh the lead. Sheffield United hadn't won in their previous eight. They were unlucky not to open the scoring after Ched Evans connected with Jamie Ward's clever corner. Ward and Evans then combined again to create the decisive breakthrough. Evans' shot was well saved by Joe Lewis, but the quick reactions of Henri Camera gave him a first blades goal in his first start for the club since joining last month. Despite their struggles, Peterborough have only failed to find the net in two matches this season. And they were presented with the perfect opportunity to open their account in this one, when Andrew Davis found Craig Mikhail Smith. George Boyd couldn't beat Mark Bunn in the United goal. The Blades' first victory since beating rivals Wednesday in mid-September. Defeat in his first match for new Peterborough manager Mark Cooper. Was that enjoyed it thoroughly enjoyed it um seen loads of things there that fill me with confidence thought we deserved at least a point um created lots of chances looked solid all over the pitch and uh, i'm pleased although we got beat i'm pleased well the views of mark cooper there uh we saw watford uh, beating scunthorpe uh, also emerged actually nigel adkins we'll hear from lizzie she'll mention it as well um scunthorpe were awoken in the middle of the night due to a fire alarm that might not have helped their cause come the game at Vicarage Road. You've had to go through something like that, haven't you? Yeah, it happened to us Friday at Swansea, 10 o'clock at night. Um, the fire line went off. We all rushed down our underpants and, and T-shirts. And it actually transpired that the, the reserve goalie slipped, dodged an old lady in the car park, now going to be out for two weeks, ruptured his ankle ligaments. Let me talk to you about Darren Ferguson and the way he's been yeah. treated at Peterborough. What do you think of that? Well, I mean, it, it, I mean, it, it seems very strange that you know, you, you've got a club who are saying what a great manager he is and... What a fantastic job he's done, yet he's gone. There was obviously a difference of opinion. I don't think this was football related. I think it was purely a difference of opinion between the owner and, and, and Darren. And there's, that's, it, unfortunately, when that happens, there's, there is only one outcome, isn't there? Yeah, OK. Now, Gordon Strachan is still seeking his first point as Middlesbrough manager, and today Borough faced up to a Nottingham Forest side who are the only team in England's top seven leagues and beaten away from home. Borough fans had yet to see their team score or earn a point since Gordon Strachan's arrival. Dave Kitson joined on loan during the week, reuniting him with former Reading strike partner Leroy Lita. And it was Lita who struck the opening goal inside five minutes, after Julio Arca's shot was saved by Lee Camp. Lita's third goal of the season, the previous two came in Borough victories. But Strachan's team couldn't push on from there, and they were on the defensive for much of the match. Brad Jones did well to save from Joe Garner as Forrest pushed for an equaliser. Rob Earnshaw came on as a substitute for Forrest and took responsibility for this free kick. A fantastic finish and a stylish celebration that keeps Forrest's remarkable away record intact. We're very pleased and proud of obviously the away record and the run that we're on. And I said before that, that this is a very good young side with great potential. Coventry's recent dismal run meant they started the weekend just three points off the relegation zone as they welcomed Crystal Palace to the Rico Arena. The Eagles have won on their last four visits to Coventry and they came close to opening the scoring when Neil Dans met Darren Ambrose's cross. Kieran Westwood with a fine save, showing no signs of the back injury that has kept him out for the last three weeks. But a Palace goal was coming and it arrived within the half hour. After some good approach work, Freddie Sears' shot come cross was turned in by Darren Ambrose for his fifth goal in five matches. Coventry were a different side after the break and got a deserved equaliser just two minutes after the restart. 
Leon Best, an unused substitute for the Republic of Ireland in Paris in midweek, with the header for his eighth goal of the season. Coventry nearly snatched all three points when keeper Julian Speroni made hard work of a David Bell free kick. New on loan signing Richard Wood couldn't mark his home debut with a goal, and it's now seven games without a win for Chris Coleman's side. We were quite gutsy in the second half. Palace had one or two opportunities themselves, but um, I think we did enough in the second half maybe to win on another day. Watford fans were hoping for a third straight home win when they hosted Scunthorpe. The Irons away record going into this match, just one win and 20 goals conceded, means they're dangerously close to the drop zone. It took Watford less than 20 minutes to breach their defence. Haida Helgerson with the header. Helgerson is a modern-day Hornets legend from his first spell at the club. And just two minutes later, the Icelandic forward was at it again. Danny Graham with the cross, Helgerson with his fifth goal in just four appearances since returning on loan from Queen's Park Rangers. Many of Watford's young loan signings have impressed this season, and one of them, Henri Lansbury, on loan from Arsenal, set up Graham for Watford's third. The perfect conclusion for Watford fans would have been a Helgerson hat-trick. But Scunthorpe goalkeeper Josh Lillis was this time able to bail out his absent defenders. 3-0, the final score. Well, we talked about the uh, Watford game a little earlier, but what about this, that terrific... I mean, the Middlesbrough game, first of all. Let's talk about that against yeah. Forest. I mean, one all. We've got a lot of strikers there at the Riverside, but yes. they can't get any goals. Mm. What, one goal in three games? Yeah, it's a frustrating time for Gordon Strachan, isn't it? Because they've fallen away somewhat um, after he's taken over. Um, he, he, yeah, I mean, he's, 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 talk, he's saying... Um, that he's not happy, and he's made that bait blankly clear as he's brought a couple in and it's still not worked. And I think he's, you know, he's going to have to find a remedy very, very quickly. Are you surprised by their return, Robbie? Yeah, we played them at the Riverside this season. They beat us 2 0. Adam Johnson was the star of the show that night. I think he's, he's done very well. Are we, are we actually going to, are we going to get somebody who hasn't beaten you tonight at all? That's <laughs> going a bit to harsh. Analyze That's a bit hasn't harsh. You? Oh, <laughs> um, he was the star of the show that night. Um, they've got to keep hold of him. You know, they complain about the strikers, but they've got strikers with Premier League experience there. They've got a lot of good strikers. You know, I think teams like Derby, Plymouth, Scunthorpe would love a bunch yeah, of strikers maybe like you've that. Yeah, maybe you've got to look at the service possibly as well, because there are some, as you say, there's some, there's some big name strikers there. Yeah. OK, well, let's hear from Championship fans then on the emails and texts. Lizzie, to you. Yeah, we've had hundreds of emails and texts, as always, some randomly about ice hockey and uh, an offer of marriage to Steve. But let's talk about the football. We've had lots of understandably happy Baggies fans. Keith, who's a West Brom fan, says, 11 goals in our last three games. Roberto is really making an impact now, so let's keep it going. Boing, boing. Lots of support for Mark Robbins at Barnsley. Uh, and we've also had very lots of uh, happy Doncaster fans, and many of you want to give your support to manager Sean O'Driscoll. Uh, Dale, who calls himself an ecstatic Donny fan, says, O'Driscoll is the best manager outside the Premier League. Uh, now, this is for you boys, actually. The strange celebration at Doncaster was apparently because on Soccer AM, they put it to the pro that the one who could do the weird celebration would win 10 quid. So there you go. That's the answer to that question. Ross says, I'm a Plymouth supporter and I work at a school in Leicester. All the kids know who I support, so I'm not looking forward to Monday because, of course, they lost. Uh, a few disgruntled Middlesbrough fans, you were just talking about it there. Zaim says, it just goes to show getting rid of Southgate was totally the wrong decision. Liam says, I'm starting to think we're going to have to with another season in the championship but James who's a Forest fan says I had to endure 90 minutes in the home end today so can you please say a huge e reds for the words that I couldn't say at the game uh, lots of support obviously for Reading well done to them for their first home win since January now let's talk about Watford which was the game I was at today Mark is a Donny uh, he's an iron for Scunthorpe says what a joke our defence are most goals conceded in the league and another three today for good measure I thought actually that Watford played very well today big thanks to John from BBC Southern Earth uh, Three Counties who said Nigel Adkins told him after the game that the team Scunthorpe were woken up at 4.30 in the morning as the hotel fire alarm went off and they had to stand in the rain for an hour so understandably they didn't play their best and quickly I'm running out of time but I've got to ask the boys do you think that Leicester are playing in the same way now under Nigel Pearson that they were with Martin O'Neill okay very quickly no OK, Steve? Uh, well, they've, they, I mean, they've got a little way to go. We, we were a good side, then. Yeah, all right, OK. Now, League One actually got underway last night as South End were looking for some consistency at home to high-flying MK Dons. A chance for the MK Dons to seal a march on their promotion rivals and put behind them last week's 5-1 thumping by Charlton. 
The start was just what they wanted as Southend were carved apart for Sam Baldock to fire past Steve Mildenhall. A confidently taken first league goal of the season. But the away fans' warm glow lasted a mere 10 minutes as the Don striker Aaron Wilbraham got his angles all wrong. Southend were celebrating the sixth anniversary of manager Steve Tilson taking charge. And Frank Moussa's goal line clearance from Matthias Dumbe kept them on track for a night to remember. The Essex club clinched their third successive home win courtesy of a penalty deep into stoppage time. Referee Darren Deadman's decision divided opinions. Don's manager Paul Ince convinced there'd been no foul at all on Francis Laurent, but Lee Barnard's not the sort to be distracted. Julie tucking away his 14th of the season with no time left for the promotion chasers to mount a comeback. So MK Don's missing out on the chance to move to within four points of Leeds overnight and the table toppers had an interesting trip to Brighton, who are now managed by their former assistant boss, Gus Poyet. Poncho's at the ready for some forward-thinking fans, but nothing could prepare Brighton manager Gus Poyet for the deluge that was about to sweep his side away. Leeds United are in irresistible form at the moment, and once Robert Snodgrass put the league leaders in front on 27 minutes with a strike of pure class, this one was never in doubt. It was the Scotsman's fourth goal of the season. Brighton have won both their matches since Poyet took over, but they were always second best in this one. Glenn Murray coming close with the Seagulls' best effort. Leeds play football under Simon Grayson, but they can be direct when they need to. Neil Kilkenny spotted Jermaine Beckford lurking with intent, and his perfect pass gave the prolific striker the chance to increase his tally for the season to 13. And in stoppage time, Kilkenny provided the finishing touch to another fine move, the Australian second in as many matches. And for Poyet, confirmation of what everyone already knows, Leeds right now are in a class of their own. It was tough, it was difficult, they scored early and, uh, and everything after it was uh, you know, practically impossible. But uh, nothing to say about us, I think all the credit to Leeds United. We showed some real good desire and attitude to some work rate, but had the quality on the ball when we needed it to. Uh, so, over the, the, all, everything put together, uh, I think that's probably our best performance of the season, yes. When conditions are this bad, referees often make allowances for the occasional mistimed tackle. But there were to be no excuses accepted for Sam Sodji's lunge, with Ryan Mason clean through. Charlton reduced to 10 men with almost an hour still to play. Not in itself a huge consolation for Yeovil, who looked certain to score if the ref had delayed his whistle. But the home side did get their breakthrough a minute before half-time. John Obika righted the earlier injustice. Charlton manager Phil Parkinson still thought his depleted side could win and told them so at half-time. And it was Sam's brother Akpo Soji who went some way to getting his sibling off the hook with a superb equaliser. Neither side could find a winner, but in the circumstances, a good point for the addicts. Struggling for goals and without top scorer Pavel Abbott for up to six weeks, the last thing Oldham need is to fall behind. But that's what happened at Boundary Park as Colchester sought to close the gap on the division's pace setters. David Fox opened the scoring for the visitors after 12 minutes. And when in-form lone Coyote Oda J rose highest to grab his seventh goal in 11 appearances, doubling Colchester's lead five minutes into the second half, that seemed to be that. Oldham needed a lifeline, and they got one six minutes later in strange circumstances. Colchester's Mark Tierney had already been booked, so when he received a second yellow for kicking the ball away, the former Oldham man was sent off, a decision that was to prove a turning point. The complexion of the match was to change completely. With their numerical advantage, the Latics poured forward, and pressure soon told. Just past the hour mark, Magnus Okwange hacked at Oldham's Chris Taylor for an obvious penalty. The same player picked himself up to dispatch the spot kick for Oldham's first goal in four matches, Taylor's first of the campaign. And with only two minutes remaining, 19-year-old Ryan Brook headed home Keegan Parker's cross. The point ends Oldham's run of three successive defeats. Colchester probably still feel like they've been mugged.
A trip to the Gow Farm is one of the most feared in League One. To call Huddersfield free scoring would be an understatement. But Gary Little turned the tables after 17 minutes. Hartlepool in front. Never count out the Terriers. Peter Hartley's misfortune had Huddersfield back on terms, though Anthony Pilkington collected the credit on the touchline for that thunderous free kick that shook the post. Manager Lee Clark acknowledged afterwards that not every home game can be a runaway win, equally satisfied with this hard-fought success, clinched by Robbie Williams' brilliant run, unexpectedly finished with his weaker foot. Hartlepool's first league defeat in six. Yeah, and six wins out of seven for the Terriers. Now, four years ago, Southampton v Norwich was a Premier League fixture. Today, the two met in the third tier of English football. Southampton have picked up well after a slow start, whilst Norwich are the form team in the division. All the makings, then, of a great game. Times have changed since 2005. Southampton and Norwich might be lower-level performers these days, but there was no shortage of quality at St Mary's. Saints were looking to bounce back after their recent revival had been brought to an abrupt end by Brighton last week. Adam Lallana's ninth goal of the season, a well-placed low drive after 11 minutes, gave them the start they were looking for. In the second half, both teams really went for it. Norwich were creating plenty of chances, and when Chris Martin managed to get behind Lloyd James, the Southampton defender suffered a rush of blood to the head. Penalty specialist Wes Houlihan levelled, but only just. Kelvin Davis pushed his initial effort onto the post, but Houlihan's blushes were spared when the rebound fell kindly for him. The weather then took a turn for the worse, but that didn't stop David Connolly from putting Saints back in front with something special on 65 minutes. The oft-injured Connolly has top-flight experience, and it shows. This was his fifth goal in seven appearances, and there really wasn't much anyone was going to do about it. Fifteen minutes from time, Norwich got a deserved equaliser when Davis couldn't hold on to Martin's effort and Stephen Hughes bundled in his first goal since August. Not quite Premier League class, perhaps, but a reminder of better times for both teams. Although we're disappointed that we haven't won, an absolutely brilliant game. we got a little bit of learning to do. They're further down the line than us in terms of the players they've, uh, that Paul's inherited and the work that they've done, uh, but we're getting better. I thought the game was too open, two really good sides really going for it and uh, I don't know if you'll see a better game all season, that's for sure. Terrific game of St Mary's. Now Millwall are storming up the table on the back of a tremendous home record. Wickham, meanwhile, have won just one game in the league all season, so it looked like a home banker then. <laughs> 150 members of the armed forces were at the new den where they were raising funds for help for heroes. Not much heroic about Wickham's season so far. The Buckinghamshire club without a win anywhere since August. Millwall, by contrast, have been scoring freely, but Paul Robinson's wayward header summed up their day. Where Robinson fouled, Wickham's Chris Westwood succeeded, the defender on the end of a superb delivery from dead ball specialist Scott Davis. And one of the shocks of a day was complete when Kevin Betsy scampered clear to secure Wickham's first away success since April. And at the seventh attempt, a victory at last for new manager Gary Waddock. Millwall's unbeaten home record had gone. Much of Cumbria may be underwater, but Carlisle worked wonders to get their game on. The Brunton Park ground staff deserve a medal for successfully draining six inches from one end of the pitch. But they might have wished they hadn't bothered after Swindon took the lead with their first attack and a moment to savour for 20-year-old Charlie Austin, a goal on his full league debut. Carlisle had their chances, but this would prove to be one of those days for the Cumbrians. Joanne Yinsa spurning one of their better opportunities, the faithful less than impressed. As conditions began to deteriorate, the match came to resemble something more normally associated with Twickenham or Murrayfield. Difficult to tell who came out on top following this ruck. And perhaps Swindon's Alex Revel thought he was going for a drop goal with this late effort. No matter, the Robins held on for all three points. It's shaping up as a very difficult campaign for Stockport County, who slipped to their fifth successive league defeat. Gary Ablett's team in trouble from the 39th minute when Ryan Harley's free kick found the corner for Exeter. From a very similar position, Stockport thought they'd save the game with just nine minutes to go. But Michael Rose's stunner counted for nothing as Stockport fell apart in stoppage time. First, Adam Stansfield inflicted that all-too-familiar sinking feeling. 
Though the match was as good as one, the Grecians even managed a third. Stansfield did all the hard work, leaving Richard Logan with a simple task in the centre. Exeter upwardly mobile and unbeaten in five. Anyone expecting a hat-trick at the Memorial Ground would have been in for a disappointment. But Bristol Rovers continued their rehabilitation with victory over the side with the worst away record in League One. Defensive frailties have been Gillingham's undoing on the road, so it was no surprise when the home side took the lead on 17 minutes. Simon Royce did well to keep out Chris Dixon's effort, but nobody picked up Danny Coles, who crossed for Chris Lyons to net his third goal in four games. Rovers manager Paul Trollope didn't seem too impressed. Trollope's anxiety may have stemmed from the knowledge that Rovers had conceded 26 goals in 16 league games. Number 27, Julie arrived five minutes before the interval. Andy Barcham had Rovers defenders backing off invitingly, and the Jills were level with their first meaningful attack of the match. The winner arrived late. Gillingham defender Matt Fry, under pressure from Andy Williams, had what will now forever be known as a Thierry Henry moment. Had it been in Paris, he might have got away with it, but referee Carl Evans was having none of it. Jeff Hughes did the necessary from the spot with nine minutes remaining. Gillingham still with just a single point to show for their travels. Walsall arrived at Griffin Park fresh from three successive wins in League and Cup, but with respect to Wickham, Sourbridge and Stockport, this looked the trickiest match. And so it proved when Ben Strevens headed Brentford into an 11th minute lead. The Londoners dominated the first half, but midway through the second period got themselves in a mess and Walsall took full advantage. Steve Jones had scored four goals in his last five games, so wasn't likely to spurn a gift like this. No maximum this time for the Saddlers, but they were pretty happy with their points. On Tuesday night, Tranmere knocked late Orient out of the FA Cup at the Matchroom Stadium. Revenge wasn't long in coming. The O's took the lead on 24 minutes from the usual source. Scott McLeish may be 35 now, but he still knows the way to goal. The lead didn't last long. Struggling Tranmere had lost seven of their eight away games before this one and had scored only twice on their travels. The third was well worth waiting for. John Welsh's long-range effort was only parried by Glenn Morris. Charlie Barnett gratefully gobbled up the rebound. The Londoners hadn't won in their last six, but with 20 minutes left, McLeish did it again, nipping in to head home Sean Thornton's cross. Problems piling up for Rovers, who are still without a permanent manager. Yeah, unbelievable that they're still in that state of uncertainty, really, but Wickham's win at Millwall, one of the standout results in that roundup. Uh, terrific performance, first win in 15 for Yeah, Durham. when you think of the... I mean, they've, they've had a couple of hidings of late. I remember, I mean, they went to Huddersfield, didn't they? Got, got, a, got a real hiding. And, and to be fair, Millwall have beaten Leeds at home. They've beaten Colchester. They've so ended two some the runs. The best runs in that division so far. As you said, it would have, you would have thought this was a home banker, but uh, it's not the way that football works, is it? Now, I've been speaking to a couple of our Orient fans. It's slightly dismayed, perhaps, shall we say, at the, the state of their club at the minute. But that was a, a valuable win against Tranmere. Uh, and Scott McLeish, that was a terrific goal it from him, from the back as well. Absolutely fantastic goal, as you can see, the keeper picks it up here. Right, OK, he's nice and positive, gets the, bowls the ball out, it's a lovely first touch into his path. Now, the whole, the whole it, there's, it never stops this move, he's always looking for the forward pass, bang, straight into the forward, and that's a great first touch, and Scott McLeish knows, as soon as, he, uh, as, soon as the, his, his teammate has a touch like that, he can run off it, all of a sudden he plays him in, it's a super finish. And what about Leeds' first two goals um, against Brighton? Uh, two quality strikes. I, I suppose nobody can catch Leeds at the minute, Robbie. Yes, yeah, a great ball there. Um, Beckford holds it well. Good first touch again. Great layoff and Snodgrass. It's a fantastic finish over the keep into the far corner. Second goal here. Neil Kilkenny picks the ball up. It's a great ball, but the, his first touch there makes the goal. Yeah. You know, he just cushions it there, opens his body out and sticks it past the keeper. You know, Leeds are doing exceptionally well. First touch, Rob, isn't it? Makes, makes if you've got a good first touch, it makes everything that little bit easier in football. Well, you, you never had one. <laughs> <laughs> he's, getting his, he's getting his back at you now. All right, let's call time out on this one. Let's hear from Lizzie on the League One emails and texts. 
Manish, this week I've heard from more Wickham and Yeovil fans than ever before, I think. Steve says, what a great result for Wickham today. Our season starts here, please keep the faith. Jimmy, who's a Yeovil fan, says, after everyone expected us to be right at the bottom, we're looking more than safe. And Matt, though, who calls himself a devoted Charlton supporter, I'm very pleased with the second half performance. I just hope we can get back to winning away more. Walsall, Simon says, Walsall for the playoffs this year, but Sam says, I'm very proud of my team, but I think the playoffs are just beyond us. As always, hundreds and hundreds of Leeds fans getting touched. Dean says, surely Leeds for promotion. Uh, Jamie, who's a Jills fan, says, we haven't won an away game all season, just one point out of a possible 27. Is that the worst away record so far? Well, I'm afraid, no, it's not. Darlington have a worst away record, but only just. They've conceded one more goal than Gillingham, and of course, in the Premier League, Blackburn have lost every single away game. Uh, Andy, who's a Swindon fan says well done to Charlie Austin on his first league goal and he wants to say a massive well done to Carlisle for a superb pitch given the circumstances and hello to everyone over there who's dealing with the floods it must be pretty awful for you um, and finally we've had lots of congratulations for Steve Tilson at Southend Richard who's an exiled shrimper in Glasgow Andy and Boise all wanted to congratulate still T Steve Tilson on his sixth anniversary in charge of Southend United the fifth longest serving manager in the country well done to you Steve yeah, great stuff, and he's had to work through some pretty tough times as well. Now, it was first v third in League Two's game of the day. Dagenham and Redbridge, who are unbeaten in six league games, took on Rochdale, who've lost just one of their last seven away in all competitions. There's a certain confidence that comes with being top, and Dagenham and Redbridge demonstrated that as they roared into a third-minute lead against their promotion rivals. Peter Gaines headed did the damage to Rochdale. The Daggers were soon pushing hard for a second as Josh Scott brought the very best out of Tom Heaton. The Essex club was making all the running. When Heaton was beaten, the post came to the keeper's rescue. Will Antwi the unlucky man? And after the break, still no respite for Rochdale. Heaton forced into action by Adam Miller this time. But having weathered the storm, Keith Hill's side began to make some headway of their own. Callum Higginbottom's cross was parried and Chris Dagnall couldn't quite get a touch. The Daggers didn't heed the warning. With 20 minutes to go, Dow were level. Higginbottom allowed too much time in the box and coming up with a precision finish. While the home side was still reeling, the Lancashire club struck again. The scoreline turned on its head in the space of two minutes. Craig Dawson clinched Rochdale's first ever victory at Victoria Road. The home side's irritation was summed up by Wes Thomas's last-minute lunge at Dagnall, which saw the Daggers play out the last few moments with ten men as their unbeaten home record disappeared. While well, splitting those two sides was Bournemouth, who've stuttered just a little in recent weeks and travelled to a Macclesfield team who hadn't won in the last three home games. Bournemouth got back to winning ways thanks to a Brett Pittman double at Moss Rose. But the match started badly for the Cherries' top scorer when he wasted a golden opportunity to give the visitors an early lead. Lee Bell's handball resulted in a seventh-minute penalty, but Siltman goalkeeper Johnny Brain guessed correctly to his left to save Pittman's spot kick. Macclesfield haven't won at home since September, but looked on course to end that run when teenage defender Sean Brisley looped a volley over keeper Schwan Jalal for his first goal of the season. But you can't keep a good goal scorer down, and in first-half injury time, Pittman made amends for his penalty miss by smashing home a volley of his own. Brain probably never even saw that one. Macclesfield were hanging on, but Bournemouth finally broke them with 12 minutes left. The home side failed to clear their lines, and inevitably Pittman punished them with a deft header. The Cherries' first league win in three sees them back in business. A lovely day out on the English Riviera for Rotherham's fans, whose afternoon brightened up hugely in the final five minutes when Adam Lafondra's header ricocheted off the knees of Michael Polk, straight to the onrushing Kevin Ellison. Torquay were on the brink of their first defeat in ten matches, but very nearly rescued a draw through Wayne Carlisle. No joy for the strugglers, instead the margin of defeat grew in stoppage time. Rotherham's third successive win on the road was complete as Lafondre took his league tally for the season into double figures. The Millers remain in the thick of the promotion race.
It was raining goals in Derbyshire as the team with the best home record in the division entertained the side with the worst away record. Chesterfield made it 25 points from 27 at Fortress Saltergate after thrashing Darlington. Veteran defender Rob Page set them on their way. On the stroke of half-time, the Quakers were undone by another corner. The ball fell kindly for Mark Allett, and he duly rifled home through a crowded penalty area. Darlow boss Steve Staunton has raided his old club Aston Villa for a couple of loan signings, and both delivered. Chesterfield keeper Tommy Lee didn't cover himself in glory, but how about that for a finish from James Collins, almost his first touch since coming off the bench. However, the two-goal lead was restored midway through the second half when impressive on-loan Crystal Palace midfielder Kieran Jalali showed a neat turn of pace to fire home his first for the club. To their credit, the visitors stuck to the task, and with three minutes remaining, they had hope again. Their other Aston Villa loan signing, Jonathan Hogg, on his Darlington debut, applying the finishing touch to a well-worked move. But it wasn't to be. A couple of late goals from former Sheffield United striker Scott Bowden broke Darlington hearts, although the first only just about made it over the line. And the same player made it five in stoppage time. That's six straight home wins and 19 goals along the way for Chesterfield. Nobody's going to feel comfortable visiting Saltergate. After three successive clean sheets, Aldershot expected their biggest test yet against the division's most prolific team. But not only did these shots defend stubbornly, they also went close to springing a surprise. Marvin Morgan gave Notts County keeper Kasper Schmeichel a scare. For their part, the home side managed 15 efforts on target and thought they should have had a penalty when Scott Donnelly blocked Lee Hughes' header. Aldershot delighted with the goalless draw, their third in a row in the league. Berry took the best away record in the division to Shrewsbury and almost came away with another three-point haul. Last week, Daniel Nardiello was denied a goal when his shot held up in the mud on the goal line. That must have been fresh in the memory because this effort wasn't going to be stopped by anything. But the Shakers were to be denied a sixth victory on their travels in the final minute when an unmarked Graham Coughlin nodded home at the far post from Omer Reza's cross. The result keeps Shrewsbury in the final playoff position with Berry just behind them. Could come back from Shrewsbury, um, but what about the game of the day, which we labelled earlier, yep. Rochdale v Dagenham and Redbridge? That's yep. a real statement of intent from Rochdale. It is. It? I mean, Dagenham and Redbridge have, have been flying at home, and uh, you know, John still was. Uh, you know, was, was was rightly confident in, in you know when going into this game, but uh, you know, Keith Hill's done a marvellous job there. I think they've you know they've been knocking on the door in the last couple of years with a couple of playoff defeats, um, and I think the, I think they've got every reason to be confident they can go one better this year. Now Burton may be the new boys of the league, but they've more than held their own. Today they welcomed the Hereford team with just one defeat in ten games. All of the meaningful action at the Pirelli Stadium came in an unpredictable second half. First blood to Burton Albion as Sean Harrod cracked in his fifth of the season, much to Hereford keeper Adam Bartlett's annoyance. The home celebrations lasted only 11 minutes. Hereford is professional club number 13 for Leon Constantine, a number that's lucky enough for them as the striker arrived unmarked to head the equaliser. But in keeping with the topsy-turvy nature of the afternoon, Constantine was rapidly rebranded from hero to villain. Judged to have handled Aaron Webster's header, it was the perfect opportunity for Albion to re-establish their lead. Harrod did the honours. Once again, Hereford came bouncing back and Constantine atoned for conceding the penalty. Ryan Valentine clipped the ball over the keeper with the forward ready to pounce. The same pattern continued. Burton edged themselves back into the lead when Michael Simpson's free kick was met by Webster. And with only three minutes to go, this time there was no Hereford recovery, much to the fury of their boss, still fuming about the spot kick. If somebody strikes a ball at you very, very hard from about a yard, yard and a half away, and it, it, it hits your hand and your hand's on the end of your arm, somewhere, somewhere down in that sort of uh, mid-waist position, I, I just don't see how, uh, how a penalty can, can be given. 
Walkham were on a decent run. Cheltenham had one in ten, and this one went with the form book thanks to a once in a career effort from former Everton wide man Lawrence Wilson. A mazy run, some high hurdling, and a well controlled finish from a tight angle. The Shrimps then had a slightly easier chance to double their advantage. Somehow, from a yard out, Phil Jevons failed to hit the target. Cheltenham are still to resolve manager Martin Allen's future with the club, and clearly their focus is elsewhere. Luckily for them, keeper Scott Brown kept his eye on this Michael Twist effort. The best they had to show for their efforts was this Barry Hale shot, tipped over by Barry Roach. Cheltenham's agony goes on. After a bad couple of weeks, which included being dumped out of the FA Cup by non-league York, there was no doubt in Crewe's determination away at Northampton. A touch more composure from Joel Grant would surely have had them in front. The recall Clayton Donaldson handed his first start in four games was causing havoc, and on 14 minutes his first goal of the season was the reward. Donaldson played a big part again as the Alex doubled their lead just before the break, stretching the home defence. The hapless John Johnson blasted the cross past his own keeper. Northampton manager Ian Sampson said he lost it in the dressing room at half-time and the rollicking worked wonders. Adi Akinfen would put Northampton back in with a shout just six minutes after the restart. The striker frequently makes the most of his sheer size and presence and kept the crew defenders at bay again before curling in an exquisite equaliser. Crew were devastated to have let their lead slip. And but for the agility of Northampton keeper Chris Dunn, Donaldson would have restored the advantage. At the other end, Steve Phillips was on his toes too, as the Cobblers went close to clinching all the points. Josh Walker was thwarted as Crew collected their first draw of the season, ultimately satisfied with a share of the spoils after Akin Fenwa's impressive contribution. Second half, the conditions suited us more and got the ball to feet, and well, the ball's around my feet sort of thing, I'm confident that I'll score goals. It's 125 years since Lincoln City were formed at a public meeting and by a tolerably large attendance of persons interested in football. Their nickname is said to be derived from a pair of imps who legend has it terrorised Lincoln Cathedral in the 14th century. Despite failing to win any of his first 11 games and coming perilously close to the sack, former England manager Graham Taylor, doesn't he look young, enjoyed five successful seasons at Sinsel Bank notably leading the club to Division 4 promotion in 1976 with a record points total. Did he like that? In 1987, Lincoln were the first club to be relegated from the Football League, returning a year later. The traditional home end at Sinsel Bank, built in 1990, is called the Stacey West Stand after Bill Stacey and Jim West, two lifelong supporters who died in the Bradford Fire when Lincoln were the opposition. For a record five consecutive years from 2003, the club suffered the agony of qualifying for the League Two playoffs, but missing out on promotion. Lincoln take to the field to the Dam Busters theme in honour of the legendary 617 squadron who were based at nearby RAF Scampton during the Second World War. Oh. And on a similar theme, that's the welcome that awaits away teams when Lincoln get a corner. But it's alarm bells ringing for Grimsby chairman John Fenty. He names his new manager on Monday, and perhaps a fresh face in the dugout can help steer the Mariners clear of dangerous waters. Grimsby haven't won in more than two months. Although Paul Linwood went close, his header flashing past the right-hand upright, provoking near hysteria among Grimsby's goal-starved followers. Lincoln have scored even fewer, but Adam Watts was denied a first senior goal by Peter Sweeney's goal-line clearance. Both these Lincolnshire rivals are in need of help. Mid-table fair at Bradford, where the home side enjoyed a sizeable stroke of luck to take the lead against Accrington Stanley. Michael Flynn's first-time cross evaded everyone except the Aki's unfortunate Phil Edwards, leaving the confused Darren Kempson wondering what on earth had gone wrong. But an ex-Bradford player upset his former employers after the break, Michael Symes tucking away his fifth goal in six games. But with just a minute to go, the Bantams were given a golden opportunity for maximum points. 
Bobby Grant's handball. And from the spot, Gareth Evans opted for power. Next time, he might try for accuracy instead. Held to a goalless draw by Hereford last week, Barnett were much brighter against Port Vale. Ismail Yakubu came close only to see his header come back off the bar. Barnett have never beaten Port Vale and weren't about to here once John O'Flynn was denied by the legs of keeper Chris Martin. Deep into stoppage time, Vale skipper Tommy Fraser, fresh from a one-match ban, lunged in with both feet on Ahmed Dean, who wisely took evasive action. A red card for Fraser, who can now look forward to another suspension. Yeah, five straight clean sheets now for Barnett at Hunderland, uh, Underhill. That's a great record for them. Um, Burton Albion, uh, good win for them against Hereford. Uh, I think Paul Pescasolido wanted his strikers to be more ruthless, and he certainly got that back from them, didn't he? Yeah, he's obviously got a hard act to follow um, in Nigel Clough. Um, bounced back from a poor defeat at Darlington last yeah. week to beat Hereford 3-2, and two old players, you know, under Nigel Clough's reign, got the goals from today. It's not happening for Dario Gradi now. He's his third spell in charge at Crew. You've played under under Dario, haven't you, Robbie? I mean, what, eight eight defeats or nine defeats out of eleven now. They took the lead twice today before they drew against Northampton. It's not going for him. Yeah, but one thing with Dario, irrespective of the league position, I know for a fact, you know, there was discontent old, un, old, under the old manager. You know, he got him smashing the ball. But under Dario, irrespective of the league position, he'll get him passing the ball and getting the young yeah, players to that, play football. That's absolutely right. And, and that was one of the first things that Dario said was, at least now we're getting the ball down and we're playing and we're passing. And, you know, the people at Crew, I mean, I'm, I'm sure they don't expect them to be, to be winning this league by 10 points. What they do expect them to do yeah. is get the ball down play and football. pass it. OK, well, let's hear more on League Two matters on the emails and texts with Lizzie. Let's start with Chesterfield, Manisha. Luke, who says, I'm a happy Spyrite. Excellent game today at Chesterfield. Full of goals, entertainment, and now we're joint second. What, what, what more could you ask for? And I've had two texts from Lewis, which made me laugh. The first one said, Chesterfield are rubbish. Then I've got another one saying he changed his mind because he'd just seen them on the show and thought they were brilliant. Uh, Dave is an imp, says, Lincoln and Grimsby are as bad as each bad as each other, bad times for Lincolnshire football. Daryl says, well done to Bournemouth and Eddie Howe for getting back on top of League Two. Steve, who's a Cheltenham fan, he's unhappy with another defeat. He says this time uh, his season ticket's in the bin, his money's down the drain and Cheltenham are going down to non-league. Sort it out, boys. John, who's a Rotherham fan, says five long hours from home, but 288 of us in cold and wet uh, at Torquay were well, re well rewarded with our third successive away win. Oh, I do like to be by beside the seaside. I'm not going to sing, don't worry. Carl, who's a very fan says we've really got to stop leaking late goals if we're going to push for promotion this season but on the plus side Alan Nil is the best thing to happen to the Shakers for years and finally Dorian who's a Shrews fan says what a great thing it was to see a female assistant referee at the New Meadow today that should be something to get you all talking this weekend thanks for the emails keep them coming in next week OK, Lizzie, thanks very much indeed. Well, thanks, as always, for your texts and emails. So here's how the table looks then after Saturday's games and Bournemouth are the new leaders of League Two. The Cherries now three points ahead of a whole host of sides who are on 32 points. Rochdale, Dagnam, Redbridge, Rotherham, Chesterfield with Notts County and Shrewsbury completing the top seven. Well, at the bottom, Darlington remain bottom. That's now 13 defeats for them this season. They're on eight points, five points adrift of Grimsby. Well, top of League One, Leeds now six points clear and with a game in hand over Charlton. Uh, Charlton now on 33, with Huddersfield and Colchester both on 30. Norwich and the MK Dons, 29 points apiece. At the wrong end, well, Tranmere bottom for the first time this season. They're on 10 points. Wickham have got 11, thanks to that terrific win away to Millwall. Uh, Southampton on 13 and Stockport, who've now lost five in a row uh, in the league. They're on 14. Well, finally to the Championship, West Brom leapfrog Newcastle, who don't play till Monday. Uh, Leicester go up to third on 30, with Swansea on 28, and Cardiff, one of four sides, on 27 points. While at the bottom, Peterborough stay at the foot, two points behind Ipswich, and Plymouth are now into the bottom three after their late defeat today. And uh, Reading out of the bottom three after finally getting that win at the Medeski Stadium. Right, we're back next Saturday after match of the day at a quarter to midnight. Watch all the goals again on the red button through till midday on satellite and cable only. But you can see us on the iPlayer all week and extended match highlights are available on the BBC website. And there's more football tomorrow. Join Adrian for match of the day two at half past ten on BBC Two. Well, that's all from us. Thanks to Lizzie and, of course, to my two guests, Steve and Robbie. Certainly hope the season picks up for you, Robbie. From all of us, have a great week. Good night.